today on Dr. Phil. A missing child. Breaking news and an Amber Alert now issued by the TBI for a missing five-year-old girl. Her parents trying to prove their innocence. They turned to social media for help, but online bullies began accusing them of having something to do with her disappearance. You didn't do anything to hurt your daughter? No, sir. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? No, I can't do this. I'm being interrogated again. There's nothing more to remember. We did see some interesting body language. And I want to go home. It has been almost four months since five-year-old Summer went missing from her home in rural Tennessee on June 15th. Her parents, Don and Candace, say they believe someone came through a wooded trail near their house and grabbed Summer. Don says that he fears his little girl is dead. Yet Candace says that she just must remain hopeful. Take a look. Breaking news and an Amber Alert now issued by the TBI for a missing five-year-old girl. The search continues for Summer Wells from Rogersville. Wells is roughly three feet tall, weighing 40 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing gray pants and a pink shirt. Now she was reportedly last seen outside of her home in the area of Ben Hill Road and Beach Creek Road. 19 agencies, including the TBI and FBI, are assisting in the search along with air crews. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation said the search for summer is, quote, definitely outside the norm when it comes to the standard amount of time for a missing persons case like this. Despite doing everything within our power and exploring all avenues, the circumstances leading to Summer's disappearance remain unclear. We continue to hold out hope that Summer will be found safe. We will not quit until we find Summer Wells. You know, in reflecting back and recalling that day, Candace says that she and Summer had a great day, from running errands to swimming in a nearby lake to planting flowers with Grandma. When they got home, Candace watched Summer go through the front door but she never saw her come out. June 15th, 2021, it was just a normal day. I called my wife and she was getting her mother's prescription, so I decided just to go ahead and work late. We just finished planting flowers and then Summer was putting the rocks on top and then she got a piece of candy from Grandma and then she asked to go back in the house with the boys. Well, she walked right in the house. After Summer went inside, I walked back over here to my mom's camper and I fixed my mom's knee brace when she was sitting right here in the doorway and I told my mom that I have to go back in with the kids. Helping my mom with the knee brace only took like two to three minutes. After I came into the house, I asked the boys where she was and they said that she went downstairs to play in the playroom. And I came into the playroom and looked, I even looked under the bunk beds and everywhere and she wasn't here at all. And when I couldn't find someone in the basement, I'd come outside and I stood up here on this hill and I hollered for her and told the boys that she wasn't down there. And then I went outside and I called Donnie right away. About 5.30 p.m., my wife Candace called and said she couldn't find Summer. I says, well, hang up for me and call 911. So I threw my tools in the car as fast as I could, got in there and started down the road and called 911 myself. I passed all kind of cars in double yellow and everything when I'm getting really worried. So I, here's my road. I pull down here, here's the creek right here. I notice my three boys are together and they're over here looking. And then I looked over that way and seen my neighbor coming this way towards my boys and my heart sunk because I knew she was abducted. I knew she was gone. Well, just like many parents of missing children these days, Don says they turn to social media for help. But instead of sending clues to his daughter's whereabouts, online bullies began accusing them of being guilty of either killing their daughter or having something to do with her disappearance. So Candace and Don say to prove the naysayers wrong, they sat down with body language experts Scott Rouse and Greg Hartley. Now, Scott and Greg are interrogators who have worked with the FBI, law enforcement, and the military. Scott says his approach is biological, and Greg looks for motivation. Together, they have been called a human lie detector. Now, Scott and Greg agreed to sit down with Don and Candace to dive deeper into their story. There's no such thing as body language of deception. There's only body language of increased stress. 
and that indicates something for us. There are no absolutes. Just because someone does this doesn't mean they're lying or telling you the truth. And in real life every day, debriefers do exactly what we do, and they find information the person doesn't remember that they saw. I thought it was a four-wheel drive, like Ford Escape or a Bronco or it something. It looked like a blue minivan to me, but I don't a know. small blue minivan? That's what it looked like to me. We knew we would get to a point where it was going to be hard emotionally. And that's hard to do because people will think you're a monster, but that's important to getting facts. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? No. We actually hit harder on the questions for what happened that day. When did this happen? How long was it before this happened? When you come home, when you first come home. No, I'm not doing all that. I'm not going all the way back. I Wait. can't do this. So you know they're, they're trying no. to help. They're trying to help. You're trying to help. It's not helping me. I know. I know. But it, it, it might. There's my... nothing more to remember. And we did see some interesting body language. I want to go home. <laughs> Well, guys, this is an interview that you conducted uh, near their home, and a lot of interesting things turned up, and I want to look at those and discuss them. Now, Scott, what has jumped out to you most about either one of these two, e either mom or dad? What's jumped out at you most? The differences in comfort and discomfort as we speak with them. There are certain things we touch on, and when, they be, when we're talking to them and they're comfortable, they start becoming uncomfortable due to stress. Those are the things we look for, and we saw those things jump out. Yeah, and we're gonna look at some of those in a minute. Greg, how about you? Yeah, Doc, so we look for a baseline, and baseline can be everything from speech patterns to movement to all of those. Everyone here, if you've ever been pulled over by a police officer, the way you talk changes, the way you move changes, that's stress. So we're looking for that when we're talking to these people. Okay. And it's different in Candace and in Don. Yeah. Now, Candace didn't want to be interviewed at first. She was very resistant to this, and it's only through building a relationship with Don and him kind of helping with that that she was willing to sit down. Now, I've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of missing children cases, and most parents are willing to do anything and everything, including with law enforcement. They say, look, rule me out. D do these elimination polygraphs, blood tests, DNA, whatever, to rule me out so you can stop messing with me and start looking with everybody else. Why was there reluctance here? There's some reluctance because they do have some history with law enforcement and those things. And if you look at us, we kind of look like law enforcement, so it takes yeah. a little bit. Yeah. yeah, you look like cops. <laughs> All right, well, let's start looking at some of these tapes just right off. Let's, let's start with Don, because you did sit down with him first, and you spent a long time interviewing him, but we've agreed to look at some particular clips that seem to be of some significance. Is there anything about Candace's story that makes you question the story? No, not the way it played out and everything like that. I mean, yeah, you always have questions, and I'd ask myself, and, uh, but the way that it happened and her emotions and her state of mind. What, did you, what were the questions that you had? I mean, I, not, I don't really have any. I mean, I question, not, I don't really have any questions. I mean. Okay, now, you, you guys know I'm highly involved in interrogation, deception, detection as well. Oh, yeah. And from a psychological standpoint, not paying any attention yet to any of the body language or any of the physiology of that, uh, I heard him say yes twice and no four times in there. He was stammering, stuttering all over the place. What'd you make of that? So for me, what I see is editing as you speak. You'll notice his eyes are dropping down to his left. He's having kind of an internal conversation about how do I answer this very complicated question. And I think he edits, he speaks, he edits, he speaks, and never finishes a sentence. There aren't versions of the truth. Correct. We were on the impression he was uh, holding back a little information from us at that, at that <clears throat> point. Okay, now this is important to me because we're trying to find this little girl. I don't care about anything else. I want to know what happened to this little girl. I wouldn't be doing this story otherwise. I'm just interested if Summer has been abducted and she's somewhere, uh, I want to find her. Uh, if her life has been taken, 
then we need to know that. I mean, answers have to be found here. She deserves that. And uh, so I'm really concerned. It's very clear to me that he is editing. That means he's holding something back, guarding something. He has knowledge of something that he's not disturbing up. That's correct. Exactly. So, and so the question is, what's he know that he's not telling us? This is the first time in any of your interactions that he ever Ooh, used this word. Yes. So we were suspicious of him, of course. And later, at this point, she wants out. She came there to help find her daughter. Correct. But you've raised the stakes to the point that, forget about my daughter, I want out of this room. Let's take a look at this next tape here, and this is just kind of a follow-up, a redirect on some of the things that he had to say. Let's look at this. So what do you say to somebody who says, no, you're involved, your family's involved? How do you respond to that? Well, for three months, I spent on the phone for three months. I, I accepted every friend request there was, people want. And, well, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, we, we can report you, and, you know, through... For three months, I stayed on the phone, day and night, trying to find her baby, because I figured you, Facebook's the best tool possible mm -hmm. to help find her. And uh, But there's this group on Facebook combating us the whole time, and we don't know who this group is or what they're up to. Okay, now, was he redirecting here, or was he just concretely answering a question? Yes, yeah, so I'll let Scott answer last, because he discovered this. When you ask this guy this question, what I was saying is, how do you respond to people who say you did this? Well, I expected, well, no, I didn't. But he doesn't. He goes on to talk about Facebook. In usual interrogations, we assume that is deceptive and avoiding. When Greg asked him how he responded to that, he's talking about responding to people on Facebook. He's talking about re responding to people on YouTube. He's had a whole lot of flack come from that direction. So I understood that he didn't see it as when a, an investigator asked you that question or when I asked you that question. He said, in other words, he took it as when social media asks you that question, how do you respond to them? That's That was his Meaning physically, how do you do it? Come up here with me for a minute, if you would, and, and let's, let's take a look at this, because this, to me, would be just real deflection and deception, unless you understand that he's very concrete for sure. in this. Let's look at how the question is asked. So what do you say to somebody who says, no, you're involved, your family's involved? How do you respond to that? Okay, at that point you said, how do you respond to that? You meant, how do you respond to it? Like, no, I deny that. I don't. Exactly. I but from instead, an abstract. he says, well, I use the phone. <laughs> right. I use the keyboard. That's what you're talking about, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Did you consider this deceptive at all, or did you think he just was answering the wrong question? Initially, we thought it was deceptive, that he was, he was redirecting the answer, <laughs> redirecting the, the answer to the question to somewhere else. That's what we, we, well, we thought. And there are two indicators that made us think that. His blink rate goes through the roof, which means you're feeling stress. But it can also be processor speed as I am trying to think through something. And we think that's what we're seeing. Okay. And when you say his blink rate went through the roof, you're talking about while he's answering the question. That's here. correct. Yes. Well, for three months, I spent on the phone for three months. I, I accepted every friend request there was, people want. Well, I'm your friend, I'm your friend, we, we can report you. And... Okay, his blink rate here is probably 70, 80 a minute. For oh, sure. Geez. And that's higher by far than anyone sitting here. Let's take a look at this third clip. Let's just watch it through and then we'll break it down. Go ahead. Do you know where Summer is? Oh, no. I wish I did. you have any earthly idea what happened to her? No. I wish I did. Do you think Candace had anything to do with it? No. And what about this? You, and you think what might have happened to her was what? She was kidnapped. Yeah. When he says kidnapped, I associate kidnapping, because of my background, with trading the person back for something. If that's the case, that has meaning. If it's just he uses words interchangeably, it has no meaning. Yeah, and, and, and we don't know. You know where Summer is. But this is the first time that, in any of your interactions, that he ever used lie. this word. She yes. was kidnapped. Okay, so that's the first time that he ever used that. And he used abducted in your lead-in footage. Yes. If you right. Notice. 
abducted. Now, and there's a substantial difference. Yes. Abducted difference. is just all of a sudden she's there, then she's gone. Mm -hmm. Kidnapped is transactional. That's right. And that, that's a guilty language thing that we collectively look for in the business. Guilty knowledge yeah. means something. So we were suspicious of him, of course, and we developed a relationship with him that caused the second interview to occur. At this point, he's cooperating. Yes. Yes. And he's been cooperating throughout. Yes. Yes. Sometimes to his detriment. Yeah. For sure. With like social media and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's Candace. And you sat down with Candace with Don. Yes. And coming up, what was the question that caused Candace to take off her mic and walk away instead of staying hooked up to efforts that could lead to finding out what happened to her daughter. And that's a significant distinction because as I said, most parents will do anything and everything to find their daughter. And you'll hear her say a very important sentence that spoke volumes to me. You'll find out what that is right after the break. What do you think should happen to somebody that did this? They should be put away for the rest of their lives. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Do you know what happened to Summer? It's been four months since Summer Wells was last seen at her home here on Ben Hill Road since the night of June 15th. Everybody's a person of interest till we find Summer. Authorities said all possibilities were on the table, but Summer's parents believe someone took her. I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. It's been almost four months since five-year-old Summer Wells went missing from her home in rural Tennessee on June 15th. Now, her parents, Don and Candace, say they believe their daughter was abducted. You just heard Don say, well, maybe she was kidnapped. Was that just him using what he considers to be a synonym, or was it leakage of something he knows that he hadn't said before? Well, we're not sure about that. But when their story broke, the couple says the online bullies accused them of having something to do with the disappearance. Now, Don agreed to sit down with body language experts Scott Rouse and Greg Hartley in hopes of clearing his name. Don says Candace refused at first, but finally agreed to sit down. Candace, I'm going to have to ask you some hard questions. I told you this. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? No. Anybody in your family no. involved with this? Not that I'm aware of, no. And you know, people are always going to point their fingers to people closest to somebody. It's just the nature of how it goes. What do you got to say to those people? I don't know what to say, but they're wrong. Why are they wrong? Because I had nothing to do with this. Okay, what jumped out at you here? Immediately, when she said no for the third time, it was quiet. It's a whisper. Okay, there's a distinct difference here, qualitatively. Yes. No. Do you know what happened to Summer? No. Do you know who took Summer? That okay, that time, nothing came out of her mouth. Right. So, first question. I told you this. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Do you know? Okay. Did you do anything to Summer? No. Demonstrative no. Yep. What happened to Summer? No. Do you know? You know, what happened to Summer? Almost identical answer. Yeah. Same, same qualitative answer. Who took Summer? All right. Do you know who took Summer? Right. Head shakes no still. The voice doesn't even say anything. A silent no comes out, and then she adjusts. We call that fading facts. Okay. Then she gets out a weak no. No. You hear strong no's to the first two questions. Correct. But then when you say, do you know? Right. It's like, no. Yeah, yeah. So what do you make of that? So I immediately wanted to go further and push a little harder. And I will say, when you're... When you do what we do for a living, sometimes people cry and you force them to cry. So this immediately caused the next question. Okay, well, let's take a look at the next tape. Is there any reason anyone near you would want to hurt you or your kids? 
Not that I'm aware of. What do you think should happen to somebody that did this? To the person that did this, what do you think should happen to them? They should be put away for the rest of their lives. I mean, they should be tormented, I think. Out of the gate, if I ask you what happened to Jordan, he was missing. You or what should happen to that person? Don't answer it because I know it would be bad. You wouldn't say, it wouldn't be a pause there. You wouldn't say put him away for a long time, he should go away forever. You would have a very extremely graphic answer to that. Exactly. Yeah, it wouldn't take me five seconds to think about it. Give me 10 seconds in a room alone right. with him and we'll be through. If someone exactly. stole your dog. You yeah, same have, answer. That's the answer. Yeah. Same yeah. answer. But here, what you get is very different. Here, what you get is a pause. Is and then a response. Person that did this, what do you think should happen to them? Okay, now, you said, what do you think should happen to them? First thing she does is close her eyes. Yes. She's blocking. We yeah. call that eye blocking or escaping, right? Yes. We're yeah. getting away. And then there's a pause. Yep, she's thinking. Watch her respiration. Watch yeah. her breathing. You can't miss it. They should be put away for the rest of their lives. I mean, this should be tormented, I think. A lot here. We see her eyebrow go up there. She's, she's not sure what she should say. Everything she's doing says I'm unsure and shouldn't be saying this. That's what we're seeing there. Yes, for sure. And then you'll notice if I ask you those same questions, your chin would jut. You would say that person needs to be put away for the rest of their life and tormented with no second guessing. The other thing you likely would not do is drift down into your right in an emotional state. We haven't seen a lot of emotion, but we see it here. Okay, but well, we're gonna see emotion here in just a second. She's talked about her disappearance. She's talked about looking for us. She's looked at the bed she's not in. She's looked at trigger after trigger after trigger and not a tear. But then you ask about the cornbread mafia. Watch the side of her mouth start dragging down. They just think they are something special. Better than you. The covert narcissist. If you're living with a covert narcissist and you don't realize it, there's just something not right. I want you to recognize what it is. Toxic personalities in the real world. They're going to tell you, hey, you're crazy. It's not me, it's you. Fill in the blanks. I'm going to talk about five things you need to do to protect yourself. Available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Since the night of June 15th, there are still no answers as to where Candace and Don's five-year-old daughter, Summer, could be. Now, I'm here with body language experts Scott Rouse and Greg Hartley, dissecting their interrogation with Summer's parents. All right, let's see this one. The guys who run organized crime around you, are you worried about them at all? Oh, they question him, and he has an alibi, you know, but, you know. What about those fellows that live around there in the Cornbread Mafia? Well, um, cornbread mafia. <laughs> That's what we call them where we live. I, I, don't, this. I have no idea. I've heard about some hillbilly mafia type stuff well. and everything, you know, and all these different boys. So we've tried to steer clear from well, all this these. This is wires up, dude. I've tried to steer clear from all these people just as much as possible. And I think they've kind of seen us as targets mm -hmm. because they have come up and stole our stuff. Uh, they come up in my shed and stole so all, all of my mechanic tools at one time. You know, when they knew where we, they knew we were gone, they knew me and her were together. Have you just hang on? Have you guys oh. put any kind of security or anything on your place? Oh. No, we don't have any kind of security. Okay, now this is significant to me for a lot of different reasons. We haven't seen a lot of tears from her. She's talked about Summer. She's talked about her disappearance. She's talked about looking for her. She's talked about her being gone. She's gone down into her room where she lives. She's picked up her toys. She's held her toys. She's looked at the bed she's not in. She's looked at trigger after trigger after trigger after trigger after trigger and not a tear. But then you ask about the cornbread mafia, which is a colloquial term for a kind of organized grassroots crime syndicate yes, in Tennessee. That's mm -hmm. correct. Correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. And let's see what happens when you ask. Let's pay attention to her. 
What about those fellows that live around there in the Cornbread Mafia? Oh, Cornbread Mafia. <laughs> That's what we call it. So we started by trying to give her a little space with organized crime. Yeah. And so Greg says, brings up organized crime, doesn't register anything with her. As soon as I say Cornbread Mafia, go watch this side of her mouth start dragging down. Mm-hmm. Because that's when the emotion hits. Cornbread Mafia. <laughs> that's what we call it. Yeah, right there is when you say it. I have no idea. I've heard about some hillbilly mafia type stuff and everything, you know, and all these different boys. And we've tried to steer clear from all these. This is why we don't do this. I've tried to steer clear. We call this insulating and running. She insulates, she starts crying, so we can't get to her. In other words, psychologically, we can't speak to her. And we see the emotion. As soon as I say cornbread mafia, right there, as we see that mouth start dragging down within seconds, and that's how long it takes to get into the brain and work around, do its thing, and say, hey, this isn't good. And it shows emotions coming from this that most likely shouldn't be there, which, of course, we'll discuss now, later. I will also say, are the tears real? Absolutely, because you can't fake a snotty nose, just to use regular old terms. And what we know is that she is feeling pain. She is feeling emotion here that we didn't see any other place in the story. So this but feels... we don't know what it is. That's it right. It could be fear. That's right. Uh, it could be guilt. It could be fear and guilt. Uh, it could be uh, uh, any number of things. We, we can't read minds. We read symptoms, as you, you say all the time. We read yeah. symptoms, but those are pretty clear symptoms. Yeah. Clear from all these people, just uh, as much as possible. And I think they've kind of seen us as targets because they have come up and stole our stuff. And they come up and, and stole so all, all, all of my mechanic tools at one time. You know, when they knew where they knew we were going. They knew me and her were together. Okay, at this point, she wants out. It, w she, she came there to help find her daughter. Correct. But you've raised the stakes to the point that, forget about my daughter, I want out of this room. It's all about me at that point. I, I mean, can't do this. Well, they're, they're, trying no. they're trying to help. They're trying to help. Yeah, we're trying to it's help. It's not helping it's me. Okay, it's okay, Ken. So let's give you a minute. That they're trying to help, so they're not helping me. That's right. That, oh, that, that made us They're go not out. helping me. If she had said, well, how's this going to help Summer? Our response would have been different, but when that took happened, us down the path. That's when They're we not helping me. Now, Candace refused to let our cameras inside the upper level of their home, but we were able to obtain footage of Candace giving a tour inside that part of the house. We'll take a quick look at that next. I want to take another uh, clip from their interview with Don and Candace, and let's take a look at just the entire clip, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Live in a country, you don't expect that kind of stuff. Calm down for a minute. Just... No, I want to go outside. These are tough questions. No, I'm being interrogated again, and I don't want to do this no more. Yes, I am. We'll, we'll stop. You just, I want you to feel comfortable. No, I want... Oh, and I want to go home. I'm down. I want to Sorry. Ah. Okay, this is right after you ask about the Cornbread Mafia, and she had the response that we saw, and now she's fleeing the scene. Yes. Um, so she starts, even before she flees the scene, by doing something that we refer to as the trancer in a, our true crime workshop, and that's making herself unavailable. Whether it's doing this or emotional or something you escape, she's already escaped. It's just a matter of getting out of that wire. Yeah. The interesting piece is contrast their body language. Uh -huh. Don looks oblivious to all of this. He's, he's trusting us and paying attention to us. She's not. It's an interesting... Yeah, and at this point... She's down in her chin. You ask them a question and, and they feel they're being threatened. You'll see that chin drop. It, it protects the neck. It's something that happens from your limbic system. It's a psychological thing that happens. So the head goes down. That's what we're seeing there, along with a lot of I. She talks about I. Want, it's not working for me. Those types of things. Yeah. They get very emotional. They lock up. Their throat is protected by putting their chin down over their yeah. throat. And then typically in pre-confession, their body will open up. And that's when you close. That's when you go after them. Yeah. We wondered. Now, 
When my producer uh, asked the Wells for a tour inside their home to better understand what happened the day that Summer went missing, Candace refused. Then she changed her mind and led us into the basement, but only after they had time to clean it. But a month after Summer went missing, Candace did invite podcaster Chris Madonna of the interview room for a home tour. Let's take a look at a little bit of that. I watched her walk in there, and afterwards, when she was already in there, I walked over to Wyatt, and he looked at me and I said, watch this, I'll be right back. And that's when I walked back over to my mom's. Okay. And I was fixing her brace and stuff like that, and I said, well, mom, I gotta go back over with the kids. And that's when I come back up into the house. Okay. With the boys. Okay. Not you walked into the house. Well, I walked into here. Get up. Walk in here and then three were sitting right here in front with her eyes glued to the TV, like always. <laughs> and I said, boys, where's your sister at? Well, she just went downstairs, mom, to play. So I, I went over here like this, because this is where the stairs are. Okay. It's actually down under there. Oh, oh, down into her or down into bedroom. Our bedroom and then hers is on the other side. Oh, okay, in the basement. Yeah, in the basement. Well, this makes sense now, see? And then I yelled and I said, Summer, Summer. And she didn't, and I listened for a minute, I didn't hear nothing. So I went like this, because this is how I would get down here. Yep. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you want to come down here or not. Do I got to be uh, <laughs> tiny to get in there? No, you can, you should can we come, come in from the other side? Well, we can, but it would make more sense if you went this way. Okay, I'll follow you. <laughs> oh, man. Good grief, no, bro. My six-foot hobbits have been fit down here. You can. Huh? My, my husband's six foot. I know if he could fit, you can. This is... Oh, my gosh. Way to go. This is my, my husband's room. Okay. And over here, well, it's a mess again. That's all right. But this is where Summer and Little Whalen was. In the interview, you ask if someone had, there's a door to yes. her room downstairs. It's a basement room, but there's an outside door. Correct. You asked, could you hear if someone had opened that door? She said, yes, you can clearly. Okay, so we have footage of her opening that door. Let's take a quick look at the door. I don't remember, I don't recall if this was locked or not. I okay. don't recall that. Okay. But I know, it's hard on But I know I did come out of here and I said, Summer, because sometimes she'll sit right here. There was a tiny squeak to the door and that was it. You couldn't hear that up those stairs, no. through that cubby hole, and around through that cluttered room with the television on? No. no. That's inconsistent with everything I'm seeing. Because everything I'm seeing does not tell me that I have a hypervigilant mom on my hands here. Agreed. It just doesn't add up to me. As I understand it, what Candace says is that they were planting flowers. Yes, sir. She had a piece of candy. Yes, sir. They washed her hands, had a piece of candy. And then she says she walked her up the stairs to the house, inside, handed her off to the boys for supervision, that the boys said she went downstairs, Candace went back outside to help her mother with her brace yes. and came back in, and all of that happened within two to three minutes. Yes. What she says. Two to I'm, five just saying, I'm saying what she says. Yes. Yep. Two to three minutes. She called for Summer, no answer, and she immediately called on on the phone and said Summer's missing. I think she will tell you that she didn't. We, we got something different the other day. We heard that after she checked the house, she crawled around under beds, she did this, she did that. She put the boys out to look in the yard, and then she called on, is what we heard. Okay. So, but she went on alert in three to five minutes. Right. Correct. Psychologically speaking, I have to tell you that's inconsistent with everything I'm seeing. Because everything I'm seeing does not tell me that I have a hypervigilant mom on my hands here. Agreed. I have a hard time believing that she would walk her up the stairs and hand her off lovingly to three 
babysitting brothers go back and help her mother and be back inside in two to three minutes calling for her daughter. Just the timeline doesn't work right. I don't believe she could get out there and back in two to three minutes. I don't believe she called for her in two to three minutes and went on alert in under five minutes and started a search. Or that she would call Don, and given Don's history with law enforcement, that his first reaction would be call the cops. Because every time the cops have been out there before that, it wasn't to serve and protect. It was to arrest and detain. Uh, it, uh, I'm not saying that Candace is involved here. I'm not right. saying right. Don's involved here. I'm just saying it just doesn't add up to me. And when things don't add up, I need more information. Yep, right. Coming up, Candace and Don are here. They're going to give their first national television interview. I'm not sure how long it's going to last. Uh, but they say they want to set the record straight, and I'm going to give them every opportunity to do that. When they come out, I'm going to ask you two to sit down here where, so you can observe them while I speak with them, and I'm going to see what we can learn. My goal here is to see if there's something we can find out. Maybe it's something that they have guilty knowledge of. Maybe it's something they know that they don't know. They're not aware that they know something that might be meaningful. They may know something they don't know is important. We're going to find all of this out when we meet them next. I have two distant relatives that called TBI the second day after someone's disappearance and told them that I'd done a horrific thing to my daughter and killed her and they put it out there on YouTube. I started getting messages constantly. Every day it was bad. Well, we're out of time for today. Tomorrow, the parents of five-year-old Summer Wells sit down with me for their first national television interview. Candace has been reluctant to talk with me. She walked off during her interview with Scott and Greg. Will she stay and talk about Summer or will she walk off from this stage? I have some very important questions to ask her. Here's a preview. Next time, the disappearance of Summer Wells. What do you think happened? I have no idea what happened. What do her parents know? You took your daughter in the house, and you never saw her come out. She just was gone. But she didn't just vaporize. Someone had to take her out of that house. In her mind, she's being interrogated. That's not interrogating you. We're trying to help you find your daughter. That's next time. You don't want to miss tomorrow when I look her in the eye and ask her some very important questions. Plus, Scott and Greg reveal their theory of what happened to Summer. That's all tomorrow. Now, before we go, I want to put up this phone number. Because if you have any information on Summer's whereabouts, please call the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-TBI-FIND. We'll have more information on drphil.com. And we'll be following this story and certainly hoping and praying for Summer's safe return. Now, I've launched a new mental health series called Toxic Personalities in the Real World. Find out what to look for and the tools you'll need when working with or being raised by a covert narcissist. Remember to subscribe and download and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, find out the secret to clean beauty and waterless skincare on Robin's podcast. I've got a secret with Bite Beauty founder and serial entrepreneur Suzanne Langmuir. We'll see you next time. Hey.